There's blood on your lies, disguised open wide. There's nowhere for you to hide. The hunter's moon is shining. I'm on it. Oh, Lucas and Zach podcast tonight. Lucas and Zach podcast. Lucas and Zach podcast tonight. Lucas and Zach podcast. Yeah. That's it. One day I'll forget to not or not forget to say the fucking <laughs> podcast name. Oh, well, hello, everybody. We're continuing our 2020 movie discussion. Um, if you know what that song is from, uh, you're a good person. If you're not, fuck you. If you don't know what that song is, why are you listening to our show? That's going to spoil everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again. We've said this a hundred times and we'll say this again. Do not listen to these episodes if you have not seen the movies, because otherwise those movies will be probably uh, less enjoyable after the fact. Except with this one, like at least like I don't think it's that spoiled. Like it's not gonna ruin your experience because I do want people to listen to it if it's gonna encourage you to watch this absolutely wonderful. No, no, no. Movie I Apple think Plus. this movie is actually quite spoilable. Spoilable. I did not know really anything going into it, and I think a certain okay. thing that happens in the middle of the movie is actually quite impactful when it finally happens. Okay. So, um so if you didn't listen to it, go watch Wolf Walkers. Now there's no choice. You have to go watch it and then listen to the show. That's Apple TV was, Plus. Yeah. Sponsored by Apple yeah. TV Plus. Yep. Hey, that's it. I think um, 50% of my Apple TV Plus watching on my subscription has just been watching Wolf Walkers three well, times. I, have, I also watch it on yours. And then... okay, let's not give this away. They're going to come uh... at me. <laughs> <laughs> you're like why is this guy watch wolf walkers five times <laughs> being someone else is awesome probably use my account to watch it it's the only reason zach for oh shit has... so my brother i'm thinking about like six times on my account you know what's hilarious as i was watching wolf walkers on that wonderful streaming yeah. service yeah they it's showed awesome. me an advertisement a preview for another show which i thought yeah. that zach would do which is of course the snoopy the show snoopy. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I, Will Zach try to get me to do a commentary of all episodes of the Snoopy show? Yeah, um, we're gonna do the uh, Snoopy goes to space, which is actually just like um, propaganda for NASA. I watched part of that. Is Snoopy just propaganda for the military? It's the real question. What? Because of because of what increased what increased fighter pilot enlistments more, Top Gun or Snoopy? Is the real question of the age. I think it's really propaganda for Christian values, and they're sneaking that stuff in. Now that we've dissected Snoopy and turned off all of our non-Apple TV Plus Christian audience, um, <sighs> let's go on to last Letterbox movie, Mr. Ford. Uh, what's yours? Um, so I, I'm I'm back going to uh, um, through the filmography of our patron saver podcast, Tom Hanks. Sorry, Thomas Hanks. Um, and I watched the classic um, Larry Crown. Yeah. I don't even know if that's the one. No, I thought the one I want to talk about. Anyways, their crowns a disaster. It's not a disaster. It's like because it's so easily watchable, but it's confusing how it was made all along. I think my letterbox review caps it off, which is um, at at every time when you're um, in pre production of a movie, um, you have to make a very important decision. Um, that decision is should we or should we not cast Rob Briggle? And once you answer that question, if you answer it wrongly, your movie's on a completely wrong track, and that's what happened to Larry Crown. Um, but instead, I want to talk about Philadelphia. I don't know if we're going to have a talk show, chance to talk about it, but that movie. Fucking rules. Um, I think that is the best, the epitome of what Jonathan Demme brings as a director. Um, Jonathan Demme is a director I have a lot of respect for. Um, I have seen you know all his movies, but Philadelphia is my favorite. Um, I think just because the humanity that he's able to exhibit, you know, through the camera, because he does a lot of close-ups, but he knows the right timing. Um, could catch like every small action on their face and, and, and reaction to what they're happening. That you see so much growth just through you know the close up on their look. Um, and it's you know how can you do better than having Tom Hanks and Denzel at the like beginning of their primes? Um, you know, going off each other and giving two of their best performances they've ever given. And it's a lovely movie. Also, I may have watched the opening of Bruce Springsteen's Streets of Philadelphia and just them like showing clips of Philadelphia. I watched at least like 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Crown is kind of a weird blip in Hanks's filmography. We talked yeah. about this movie recently. In the, this is a movie he directs, he stars, he co writes. So, this is clearly a passion. Yeah. Writer. But no one likes this movie. Did he try to write the comedy? There's like it just shouldn't have been as much going for laughs as it was. It was like too quirky. Tom Hanks 
does not take work. And that's part of like what's wrong with the terminal too. When he's trying to write it, I don't really understand what's happening. Because Google Maboth, the raw character, is like out of this planet. Just goofy. Well, there's just going to be a weird thing in Hanks' career. Whenever he tries to do something that he's like really passionate about like that, it just doesn't super work. Like he works what? better. He works better when other people create stuff for him than when he tries to create yeah. stuff for himself. What was he passionate about with this? There's nothing to this movie. I understand. I don't, like, I don't know. That but thing like, you do because there's like a 1950s, 60s music thing that you might have a lot of passion for. But this is what. I don't know, man. I mean, but if you if you're co-writing, if you're Tom Hanks movie star and you're co-writing, directing the movie, um, you clearly have some passion for it. Do you think? You he owed a bet from a childhood to a kid named Larry Crown. And he says, if you wear this bet, someday I'll make this movie about you. I looked it up. I guess this is based on his time studying in college. At least that's what Wikipedia says. This is, did did a lot Tom of Hanks fuck his college professor? I, uh, well, <laughs> we can either confirm or deny this. Uh, Philadelphia is really good. Uh, yeah, I think great. when it comes to Jonathan Demi, I do like Silence of the Lambs more, but... That's just. I was on the Rachel Gain Mary Train, but Philadelphia and Rewatch. That is really good. Rachel Gain Mary is really good. It's really good. Yeah. I haven't seen either of those for a while though. Um, yeah. So you had you've been having some fun with Tom Hanks. Do you have any hot takes on Hanks? Movies that are better than people say they are, or worse than people say they are. Um, extremely loud, incredibly close is not bad. That's my okay. take. I disagree with um, that one. Talking about all the ones I recently watched, I saw I'm a Punchline fan. We talked about that on the show before. I think Punchline's really good. Um, I like that's not in uh, recent ones. I don't know. Really bad. I think all the classic ones I think are bad are bad. Um, but things like Glare Crown, I don't think as as bad as people make out to be. Maybe I'm just more tolerant and used to Hanks at this point. Um, I'm really excited to watch um, Inferno um, in the upcoming days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not really, but um, for some reason, I think I was talking about this pre-show. But there's something about Tom Hanks that no matter how bad the reputation is for certain movies, as like see the cast in the story, like the circle, fucking like Emma Watson and Tom Hanks and um, oh shit, what's his face? That's the director who has done a movie, a lot of movies I love, Jason James Ponsel. James Ponsel. Yeah, and um, and Dave Eggers, you know, it, it John Boyega, Dave Eggers wrote the book. Jaron Gillen. That book is supposed to be pretty renowned. I'm like that movie can't be bad, so I'm still convinced the circle is gonna be great, no matter what every single person hates that movie. It's not. Same with Inferno. Inferno's going to be good. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's not going to be good. Um, yeah. I do think Hanks has kind of that quality, that Cary Grant, James Stewart quality, where, like, the movie is not great, but he's charming enough that he – you rarely walk out of a Hanks movie going, I fucking hated that, the way you do with a lot of other people. Because there's just, like, a, a, a baseline level yeah. of charm and, like, nicety to Hanks that makes you go – Oh, it didn't live up to my Hanks expectations, but I can't give that half a star because I didn't hate that as much. I do think with Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, it's him and Bullock, like, single-handedly pull that movie into, like, a bull enough for me because there's so much horrible going on with that. And um, just the way they design the kid is, like, how are you supposed to really root for him? They just go a little over the top with, with uh, the kid actor. And this, and uh, but Tom Hanks and Sandra Bullock bring it back down to earth and really bring the heart of that movie. So Tom Hanks can save movies, and that's why it's fun for me to watch it. He did not save Bonfire of the Vanities, unfortunately, because he was terribly miscast. No, I don't know if Hanks can save a movie. I don't know if he's that yeah. good. I think he. I think he's a lot. I think he. I think if you just look throughout his career, there is a clear um, trend with his best movies that there are also other talented creators working on those projects. Like I think there's a reason you see him doing some of his best work with Spielberg or Efron or Demi or like I feel like there. You know, there's like, there's a trend of being like Zemeckis, um, Polar Express, classic Green. The Zemeckis, I there's like talent now director. Castaway. Let's be clear. We're gonna say the good Zemeckis movie. It's Castaway. <laughs> Um, Tom Hanks is not even in Polar Express. Uh, that was a nightmare vision. Of... <laughs> I, I said what people think, and I'm like, Forrest Gump is a classic here. I mean, honestly, he works in Forrest Gump for what that movie wants to be. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't think what that movie wants to be is ever going to be great. But I think Tom Hanks is the only person who can make that movie seem somewhat charming rather than horrific and awful, which is, I think, in the hands of anyone else would be like is this are, are we making fun of people with disabilities like is that the yeah. is that a, like you know and i think hanks is good enough to be like 
to make it a movie where it's like, oh, okay, this is goofy that he happens to walk into every famous historical event, but we're not mocking people with, you know, developmental disabilities, which, you know, is sort of unpleasant and not something you want to watch. But I do think I still have like 10 or 15 more to rewatch or watch for the first time mm -hmm. that I think there is six of his movies that are 10 out of 10s and maybe in my top 100, which is probably the most of any actor. It is a little unfair because three of those are Toy Stories. Oh, just three Toy Stories? And one, two, and four. I don't think three is in my top 100. And that's I, and I don't know if three is in my top 100. I don't know if those movies are in my top 100. I do think Hanks does have a really... But again, again, this is because he works with really talented people. It's not He's not just trying to go it alone. The yeah. fact that he does stuff like Toy Story or he does stuff like, you know, with Spielberg. Um, well, they really does help him. Really does help him. I think you know, consistently have just like a trend of good stuff. Thanks for everyone tuning in for our second uh, month on Tom Hanks. <laughs> we <laughs> really should we have done a News of the World? Uh, you got to watch News of the World. Maybe we should do a special episode. I feel like Tom Hanks is our podcast, and we have to do every Tom Hanks movie that comes out. Is News of the World even available without paying twenty dollars? Um, I think so. I don't want to because I I look at all these things. I don't know if you. I go to Amazon and I look at like the the twenty dollar in theater online experience things. Um, there are like so many movies I'm just not willing to pay twenty dollars for. Well, fortunate for me, I am double vaccinated and going to the theaters tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's still twenty bucks online. It's twenty bucks, yeah. Yeah, must just a little more close down other places. Um, my last letterbox movie because we just talked about my tanks is hilariously also two movies. So I watched um, force majeure and downhill. So that downhill is the American remake of force majeure force. So um, I hate when Americans remake European movies. You hate because Americans period. I hate Americans period. Um, Europe is a superior country for many reasons. Oh um, my God. You, the show is over. I can't, you just said that Europe is a better country. <laughs> I, continent. I, 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 continent. Thank you. I'm not allowed to be on a podcast with dumbasses. This is what I was told. My apologies. My apologies. I would still take the country of Europe over the United States. <laughs> the country. You just jam it all together. The fictional made up country of Europe. <laughs> um, American movies don't understand the sensibilities of um, European movies is the big problem. Uh, so Force Majeure is the story of family that goes on a ski trip in the Alps. They are in Switzerland, I think. They in Switzerland? Sure. There's a mountain. France? Yeah. Somewhere? But they're somewhere they're somewhere in the Alps. They're somewhere Austria, maybe? They're somewhere in the Alps. I um, can't even tell you what country Force Majeure is made by. What language are speaking? Is it Dutch? I don't know. I believe they're speaking they might be speaking Dutch. I will look this up. Um so there's it's a French movie, I believe. It's a French movie? Nah. Ruben it's, is a, it's a French phrase. Uh, so they're Swedish family. Wife is they're at the French Alps. It is a French movie. No, it, okay. okay. They're, they're at the French Alps. It's a Swedish movie. It, Ruben Osland is from Sweden. It's a Swedish movie. I don't think it's a Swedish movie. It's pretty Swedish. Um, it speaks four different languages. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, it is a Swedish. It's a Swedish entry for best foreign language film. This is great anyway. podcasting. <laughs> this is great podcasting. Okay, so this tells the story of a family. They go to the French Alps to go skiing. While they're there, an avalanche happens. The dad happens to run away from the family. And then you watch kind of the interpersonal problems of the family break out. Um, because obviously, if, you, if you're the wife and you're sitting there with your kids and your husband, and you think something bad is about to happen, and your husband grabs his phone and sprints away from you, that could potentially be a problematic scene. Um, and Force Majeure is this wonderful, like, dark comedy, um, it has a bunch of great music, it's got some really great performances, um, the dad is a significantly more complex version in Force Majeure than he is in Downhill, he has, like, some crazy breakdowns, he clearly has some issues beyond even the stuff that comes up in the film, the relationship is more in trouble to begin with, and there's more kind of nuance to it. Their friends come over, their friends disagree with them, then their friends start fighting about it. And it's sort of like a movie about what happens when, about how one small action can uh, snowball into a bunch of other reactions. And it's this really wonderful movie that's really fantastic. And then um, 
the directors of the way back the way way back my yeah. apologies not the ben affleck movie um which is better than the way way back. um is, isn't there a um a peter Wurr movie that's something similar to is that the maybe. way 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 back I don't know. I'll, we'll be looked that up now. Um, <laughs> so they took that movie. They took Will Ferrell. It's just called and, The Way Back. Oh, interesting. So they had the same title as the, uh, yeah. the Ben Affleck movie. Yeah. Um, and they took Will Ferrell to play the dad, and they took um, Julie Lee Dreyfus for the mom. And that movie stinks. Um, because the original is really nuanced and complicated – and does a lot with silence and how people express anger and frustration and contempt um, through silence. There's a lot of scenes in the original that they allow to play with silence. They allow it to be really awkward. So when you have the wife really questioning her husband and his his instincts and his protection of the family, there's a lot of silence and a lot of you know complex moments that really let you stew in these uh, these feelings. Are and you the American you Will Ferrell doesn't include a lot of silence and complexity. It's not just sports. Will Ferrell. <laughs> the script is also it is much louder. It is much mm. more ham-handed. It is a much more blunt movie. Um, the ba- same basic events occur, except you never feel the tension in Downhill like you feel in Force Majeure. Have you seen these two? Not seen Downhill. Seen Force Majeure. I've seen Force Majeure, yeah. which is great, right? Um, yes, the best part is the title, but it is a really good movie as well. I, I don't want to revisit it because as I'm, you know, b- becoming a father and I think just increasingly becoming a worse person, <laughs> um, it, it might, it might hit me a little too personally and make me, um, rethink my whole life. Yeah. Um, Force Majeure is really good. Downhill is kind of a really lazy, um, American remake. They do kind of the bizarre thing you see with American remakes where they try to simultaneously ape the original, like almost directly like shots and moments. But then they just like – it's so frustrating because it feels like somebody read Force Majeure, didn't get it, and then wrote Downhill, and that's it's like half the problem. Um it's like they liked good. the like premise and the, the gimmick that provided of someone, but then no right understand the themes or that can go with it. They don't understand the complexity. They don't understand the emotional stakes. They don't understand the emotional interactions. They just understand the basic concept of husband runs, wife is mad, and that's they kind of the, int- the title. Force Majeure is really cool, but we're gonna make it better and call it down. And they kind of add some like cheating side plots, which is. Not in the original. The original has discussions of relationships and monogamy that are like these complex discussions. And Downhill gets Miranda Otto playing a really bizarre, ac- bizarrely accented woman who is just like, yeah, I sleep around with everybody. And it's kind of the classic uh, Americans can't deal with any kind of sexual relationship that's not like monogamy. Pu- puritanical or something. Like they just can't deal with it. Um, and even like the friends in the original one played by Christopher Hybu and some woman, I don't remember her name. I'm sorry. She's not as famous as Hybu from Game of Thrones, but like the friends in the original are much more interesting characters. And in the, in the sequel, it's again, the sort of no name female, char- female partner who's an actress. I don't know. And, uh, Zach Woods from like, you know, American TV shows. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, traveling around Europe, hashtagging everything on Instagram. And it's like this really vapid, lazy, like lame. In the original, the the couple, the friends, are like get into their own long form intellectual argument about what you would do in the scenario. And in the sequel, it's just like this lazy, vapid stuff. Um, yeah, it's just, they don't understand it. Like, why would you, I don't understand this American trend of like remaking. I mean, I guess it makes sense in context why you want to do this. Why didn't I don't understand why they tried to do Force Majeure as the remake. I don't think saying Downhill was a remake of Force Majeure made anyone go watch it. I think anyone would have watched the Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Will Ferrell skiing comedy anyway. And it's just such a weird choice to, to directly tie it to this movie that is not only so much better, but is just way more interesting and complex. Yeah. Yeah. So, Please I'm glad cancel. I didn't see it. That's all I gotta say. No, okay. yeah. Who are you canceling? Oh, uh, please! Can we please cancel the remake, American remakes of Tony Irvin and A Man Called Ove? 
just please cancel those things. Do you think of any good American remakes of foreign language films? The Departed. Yeah. The Departed. Um, There's not many. I mean, honestly, if you look at the history, there are some in the context of like, okay, there are some that exist. The ones that exist are like 30 to 40 years between the movies. The ones that are not good are the ones where it's like movie comes out, foreign language movie comes out and does well. And then they try to do the remake three years later. Those don't work. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly was for the Tony Irvin remake if it was Jack Nicholson just to get back on screen and he seems like ideal for that role, but he dropped out and now I don't care. Yeah. So it's just going to go to Bruce Dern, right? <laughs> I just don't want this movie. Why would you? You don't need to remake. You can't remake Tony Erdman. The That movie doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense as an American movie. There's stuff in that movie that you can't do in an American movie because your audience would not react to it the same. The There's last entire... director, it was originally going to be directed by Lena Dunham or God. written. It got replaced to be, um, and this is 2018, um, Lisa Cholodenko, which I think could work. Maybe. The Birdcage, I guess, is another remake. Some Like It Hot is a remake of a French film. Well, if you go old, there's going to be a lot of them, I think. See, but those actually work because those are usually – it's the 1950s and we're remaking a 1930s French movie. That actually tends to work in the way that the American trend of let's remake a movie that happened three years ago just doesn't work. Yeah. Please don't remake Tony Urban. Tony Urban is great. Tony Urban is one of the funniest movies of the 2010s. Tony Urban is fantastic. Watch Tony Urban. It's so good. Do not watch some – that's the worst thing is like you know that if they did a Tony Urban remake with Jack Nicholson, more people would watch the shitty remake with Jack Nicholson than watch the original movie that's significantly better. And it would all but drive you us don't out. know that it's significantly better. So let's not speak in, in theoretical terms. Let's I'm gonna be, just you're being unfair to the casual viewer without knowing what the actual movie is. What if it's a mess? Jack Nicholson would have been really good. I'm just saying. Jack great. Nicholson hasn't acted in years, though. I know. That's why I want that movie to be made. He's made for that role. It's just like it's he basically is doing a Jack Nicholson thing. Just like yeah, but I don't. Th- I think Jack Nicholson would be honestly kind of bad in that movie because that character is hey. is Jack Nicholson doesn't know how to play that character the way that the original is supposed to be played. This is Tony Erdman. If Tony Erdman fucked, that's Jack Nicholson. It's Tony Erdman. <laughs> Jack Nicholson isn't the Tony Irvin. Tony Irvin is his daughter. Do you see the movie? I don't remember names, character names. I'm proud that I knew someone's name was actually Tony Irvin. She's the the title character. Okay, who's Papa Irvin? Papa. I just don't think Jack Nicholson would be good in that ball. I'm just going to say. I, I think he is... He's too hammy for that performance. And also, that's like a movie where like the, the famous actor should not be the dad. It should be the daughter. That's because that's the daughter's movie. Yeah. What if um, they, instead of On the Rocks, Sofia Coppola directed Tony Erdman with Bill Murray and Rashida Jones? That would work. He's just not old enough, but it would work. No, because I kind of like I, I like On the Rocks, and I love Bill Murray in On the Rocks. But doesn't Rashida Jones seem like the good, like straight person that can lose herself a little bit near the end, as in that Tony Erdman role? Because she plays no. the titular Tony Erdman. No, because Tony Erdman, the the main character is a dramatic performance, not a comedic. It's a comedic performance because of the circumstances, it, it but the performance is dramatic. As it like, she starts to, to loosen up a bit. Yeah, but you need a you need a you need a dramatic actress to play that role that yeah, happens you, to become. I forgot your version to Rashida Jones, so I don't, I didn't mean to bring this up. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I don't. Okay, we'll, we'll get into this. Fine. On the Rocks, I think, is not as good as some of Coppola's other work because I think Rashida Jones is kind of not much of a performer. I think she's she kind plays of there. her role and that part was like written for what she does. Is sort of. that that kind of straight laced person, kind of serious that that can get forced to loosen up? That's what she does. I, that's what that role is. I feel like that role could be more with a more talented actress in the role. I just think that Rashida Jones is kind of. I, I think I said this to you. I, Rashida Jones has been the same actress since The Office. Since Parks and Rec, like there's not there's not a lot of progression in her career. She plays the same characters. She plays them with the same level of you know. Have you seen Celeste and Jesse Forever, where she gets to? She also wrote that movie, 
So that is that sense. the one with Adam Sand- uh, with Andy Samberg? Andy Samberg, yes. I have not she, seen this she movie. She gets to like play depressed and and lose herself a little bit. So I probably should see this movie because I like Andy Samberg, but it's um, a great movie that has gotten forgotten. This is by far in our community of um, friends, online movie friends. Uh, this is one be the what if that everyone's going to give ten stars to, and then I'm going to forget I like it. Wait, Rashida Jones is in Klaus, the movie that's not good. Not good. Let's talk about Wolfwalkers, which is a lot better than yeah, Klaus. Let's, let's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot better than Klaus. Y'all crazy out there giving Klaus this mediocre-ass movie five stars. Um, we're going to go on to a movie that's actually a five-star movie and freaking awesome, and that is Wolfwalkers. Wolfwalkers, my nickname in high school. Yep. Zach Ford was a streetwalker who tried to service wolves. I had no idea where you were going to go with this. But you're exactly I mean, right. That's why they called me that. I was fucking wolves for money. I, read, I started that joke and I was like, how on earth am I supposed to land this in any way? And I was like, this is the only way to go. It's not a good joke, but I'm going to say it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, Zach Ford, why don't you give us a plot summary of the truly amazing film Wolfwalkers? Um, I decided after I was like completely boshing and had a very just boring plot to me for um, which I was last year old vision. Borat. We didn't do Borat. I thought you rightfully skipped it because I was starting to lose grasp oh. of the segment. Um, I'm also burping a ton because the soda water is really, really getting to me. Um, I'll try to control myself. So I'm going to go, I'm going to keep this real, real concise. This is going to be the new version of this this segment. Um, so there is a this this little um, kind of blocked off town or city, um, an island that has became under British control and taken mm-hmm. over by um, what's his face, the Lord Protector. Uh, well, thank you, Lord Protector. Uh, there is a girl and her father who had to come from England, brought there as hunters to get rid of the wolves so they can cut down trees and expand their territory. Um, but the the wolves are um, not protected, but um, are amongst a couple of wolf walkers who are in Irish folklore are people who can they're can change into wolves. Um, almost it's like their their version of what a werewolf would be. It's a lot more peaceful and friendly version of what a werewolf would be. Um, and magical in that sense. Um, and as you know, the girl tries to help her father um, to say she can hunt wolves too, and um, she's kind of sick of being held in tight. She gets bitten by the young girl wolf walker, and she becomes a wolf herself. And the rest of the movie is about um, kind of that battle between the um, the city and their um, not grudge, but um, you know the, the 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 feeling that it's necessary for them to expand their boundaries, no matter the cost. I mean, they're kind of disregard for the natural world, um, and versus um, you know this magical nature community that just wants to be allowed to thrive and survive. Um, and it's a lovely little folktale about people that turn into wolves as they go to sleep. Yeah, there we go. This is interesting though that like. Um... Irish folklore is filled with these stories of people becoming animals, animals becoming people. Because this is like similar yeah. to the idea of the Selkies, the seal Which people. Is one of their previous films, The Song of the Sea. And also The Secret of Ronan Inish, which is a, a good um, John Sales movie, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lot of tales that, you know, get reinterpreted by different um, cultures throughout the world because. Um, the Saukis is similar to what like mermaids would be and other people that they, they come up with. And then yep. you know, the wolf walkers is what we come up with werewolves or other cultures of sure their own things. Um, so I do want to start the I'm starting the conversation on the host of this show now, motherfucker. Um, I do want to start talking about um, Cartoon Saloon. Um, yeah. Car- Cartoon Saloon is the Irish company. Um, and maybe owned by Tom Moore. Uh, he's at least been like the creative head. He's like the Hayao Miyazaki of uh, Cartoon Saloon. There is a there's really a co-founder. Okay, and um, I think the only other director to make a movie is for Breadwinner, um, who is Nora Twomey. Um, also, this one also is this co-founder. one is co-directed. Yeah, also a co-founder. Okay, also so Nora Toomey, Nora Toomey, Tom Moore, and Paul Young co-founded Cartoon Saloon together. Okay. 
So Tom Moore has made three of the movies on this one's co-directed, maybe hoping to guide someone into becoming the next um, director for Cartoon Saloon, as they, I hope they expand um, their production, uh, because I think it is the closest to another company, another culture um, being inspired by Studio Ghibli and kind of making that, that their own. At least they're taking the storytelling lessons that you can learn from what Studio Ghibli does well and adding their own unique visual style and I think unique stories they want to tell because they, they used, I think, the same heart and emotion and empathy towards children as all these movies revolve around children. Um, but they can tell it through Irish folklore that, you know, Stuart Dribbley wouldn't be able to do. Um, that I just find remarkable. Um, but there's also their animation is usually so geometrical um, that I think no one else is doing at all this time. It makes it so unique and stunning. Um, that's the reason I turn into these movies. I'm astounded by the animation. It's like reading mm -hmm. the best picture books you can find. Because um, I, I honestly don't care what most of these stories are because I am just thinking so much about everything I am visualizing. I think about each line. I think about how the colors come together. Um, <laughs> and honestly, watching this, this is my third time helps because I think a couple times I get distracted just taking in the image a little bit because it's also stunning. Um, but I, I th this has became, Cartoon Saloon has became a studio that I am probably most excited for something to come out. It's like jumps immediately to my most anticipated of the year. And this was once I found out this was coming out. Um, I, I just adore all three of the Tom Moore's and move, more movies, um, Song of the Sea and Secret of Kells. Um, and I like Breadwinner quite a bit as well. Nora told me is making a new movie. I think coming out next year yes, or so. Yes, it's coming out this year, and this it's year. based on the book series My Father's Dragon by Ruth Styles Gannett, which I read Fuck as a kid. It. It's about and it is a great, <laughs> it's a great book series about a kid who runs away from home and tries to free a dragon that's being held captive. It's a wonderful story, and I do think they probably will do quite a good job with it. I, I, I think also just because these, like, Coming of age tales that these can essentially be, but through the lens of fantasy and folktale, are just completely up my alley. Think of all the things I love: Peter Pan, like the BFG, it's just, it, and and Sue Ghibli. That's you know what many of their movies spirit away is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, so just taking, you know, that that lens, I'm always going to fall for it. So that that's probably why I'm a sucker for the style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Um... You're right. Have it you is seen like, their other movies at all? I have not. I've seen, oh, I've seen Broadway, which I was kind of mad, to be honest. I, yeah, but that's the only one that's steeped in realism. Like so, that. I've so I've I've read the Breadwinner books, and I was you know very familiar with them when I go into that. And I thought that story was a somewhat disappointing um, presentation of the story of the books. Um, this is wonderful. Wolfwalkers is great, and honestly, I think if you're them, you probably shouldn't do breadwinner stuff. My Brother's Dragon fits in because it is more fanciful. There's just something about the animation style and the way that they create these worlds that works really well for this combination of folklore and magic. And like, yeah. it does a really good job with it. Because um, it's made to create worlds. And you're not creating a world when you do something that's the, Well, the animation style is intentionally non-realistic. It they Nobody looks like a person. They're all blocky and they're too big or too small or or they, their hair is too big. Like, you know, the main, the the little girl in this who turns to the wolf, she has like way too much hair. Like it doesn't make any sense from an actual person perspective, but it works really well with the narrative style and like the, the style they're going for in this film. Um, so I, I actually do really want to see the other two they've done. I just haven't gotten around to them yet. Um, this is just really wonderful. Uh, I am, you're right. Um, Cartoon Saloon does feel like a Ghibli. I think the only difference between this and Ghibli is that Cartoon Saloon does not have the impact even in Ireland that Ghibli oh. always had in Japan. Um, if you look at these movies, they're made for like between three and five million. The best of them gross, like basically get their budget back. But do you think um, that's because Ghibli already exists? So this isn't like really creating its own path. It's coming down a path that, you know, even a lot of people in Ireland have probably seen the Ghibli films. It's hard to become a big company after something. I, so I think some, I think they could, I think they could pop. Um, they have a really interesting situation where they are consistently really well reviewed throughout all their movies. They're all like 90 plus on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, I think the biggest difference between them and Ghibli is that really early on in Ghibli getting to the US, Ghibli got the Oscar for best animated movie. 
And Cartoon Salon has really... Uh, have they gotten a nomination yet? Secret of Kells was nominated and Song of the Sea, I believe. They were? Okay. And um, Broadway, weren't it? What'd you say? I think they're all nominated, but never really felt they had a chance. And it's going to be the same thing with Wolfwalkers this upcoming year. So At I least, I would argue Wolfwalkers is the closest they've ever had to be in contention. Wolfwalkers does feel like running number two in the race right now. Those other ones always definitely felt like they were like, congratulations on being number five out of five. I, I do want to say why the Oscars, in a way, are very important, is that's probably how I know about Cartoon Swim. I'm pretty sure I watched Secret of Kells because it was this out-of-nowhere nomination for Best Animated Picture, and it's just what that can do for a, a movie, let alone a whole studio, because they got my attention and then maybe a, a forever fan. Yeah, absolutely, and I think in some ways the reason, like, they would become a much bigger company if they had the Spirited Away win that Ghibli got, because then spirit, they get the... Spirited Away. What? It's hard to make a spirit in a way, though. Sure. But, like, you know, they, they could have won one of these years, maybe. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons you see that, like, they may struggle to, like, get the box office. If they had one movie that came out and won the Oscar, I think they would probably make more than $8 million, you know, from a return. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe um, the dragon movie. Boy and the dragon. Dragon not named Pete. What's it called? My... Uh, my father's dragon you don't even know okay there you go no it's my father's dragon i read these books I read all. my papa tony urban's dragon i would love that oh go away <laughs> <laughs> um so i do actually think it's something i did not realize until i was looking at the wikipedia for this film before this is that the lord protector is actually supposed to be oliver cromwell the actual historical figure who became the lord protector of the british isles and of ireland um in course, the 1650s you know. The real history be I do research that board. Um, he was the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland from 1653 to 1658, which is when this movie occurs. Um, so I think there is interesting. Uh, I wanted to touch on this really quickly, don't have to get too deep. I do think this movie is interesting in its context in the history and politics of uh Britain and Ireland. There is like an interesting context, but like even in the interactions, like in some ways there is um, more of a fanciful nature to the Irish and uh, their folk tales. And so this movie is in some ways a commentary on um, British invaders versus, um, you know, the Irish who are already there. In some ways, the Wolf Walkers are a stand in for the Irish people being overrun and subjugated and driven out of their land by British invaders. Yeah. And there is kind of a there, the, the way that, colonizing yeah movie. absolutely there's, like, there's, some, there's some joy and sweetness to wolf walkers versus this like rigid society of the british which i think is supposed to be a commentary and is obviously part of the folk tales that these idea are based on because i also think especially with kids they can often empathize with the idea of colonization being done through the lens of nature. I think we, we often deal with how nature, nature can get invaded and we know like chopping down trees and taking away their ecosystems is horrible. And that's something that's presentable to kids. But the concept of colonization against um, a, um, you know, a culture of people that already exists is harder for kids to conceive in, in a way that's appropriate for them as well. It might so be too I, scary. I, I, and it might be too scary. So this movie does do a perfect job at I think creating that analogy it can be a conversation start because the Irish storyline is still there, but the primary conflict is happening through the conversation of nature. Yeah. It's all it's all subtext is there with the Irish. Did you did you I, so one thing I noticed when I was watching this movie is like I made the connection very quickly to uh, the Disney film Pocahontas. Um, the Lord Protector Cromwell reminds me a lot of Governor Ratcliffe, even in um, design a little bit. He correct. looks like Governor Ratcliffe. He really does. Um, and there was kind of like the, the same thing with the nature where like, yes, there is the colonization of the Native Americans in Pocahontas, but they also play that out by adding in the animal right. characters that are easy for kids to understand. Oh, wow. Maybe Take it's it scary. Like, let's we don't want the raccoon or the the, the bird to lose its home. Like there's like, you know, there's good um, ways for uh, like kids to understand it in the same way. This movie does it with the wolves. And you got the cool little falcon, and like you have a kids, you have kid <laughs> protagonists. That... What the fuck is happening? You're not supposed to have other friends at your house. 
People are not supposed to be around there. I don't know what's going on. I will yell at people after. My apologies, folks. Um, <laughs> that was honestly terrifying. That laugh <laughs> needs to be censored. And yeah, don't worry. It'll happen for. Okay. Um, seriously, <laughs> fucking idiots. They know I'm recording. Um, yes, it is. Uh, they kind of they do this well by putting the ch child protagonists at the front and allow you to relate to that because. Um, even having the main character who is not magical at the beginning, it is really easy as a kid to relate to the idea of, hey, I want to just go explore with my parents rather than getting stuck back in this boring place. Um, it's just very relatable on a lot of levels. Yeah, I, I think so. I feel like most of the conversations about this film can talk about the animation visual style because it is just um, so remarkable, but also st stunningly purposeful in its yes. thematic connections. Yes. Um, the the animation really tries to tie themes together. So, because I'm connecting this to the idea of colonization, but the way they make the city look, where it almost looks like a blueprint from afar, mm -hmm. but everything, um, the contrast between everything natural and everything kind of industrial and city wise is so so stark um, because the the towns is where geometry is at its finest. Everything gets rigid lines, you know, yeah. thick bold lines and it looks unnatural and like it's just placed on there it doesn't belong there because everything surrounding it all the trees um and the characters um is more impressionistic they're more like the colors are swirling in together there's no defined lines everything just kind of runs so the city just stands out more making i think even subconsciously for a kid mind you can go that doesn't belong there like this is not supposed to be here so yeah. it still pushes the idea of the unnaturalness of colonization also, if you go even farther than what you just said, if you look at the city, the city lacks movement. It's not dynamic. Yeah. The only thing that happens is you see smoke coming up from chimneys. Everything else is solid and stuck there. When you go out in the forest, everything is alive. The trees Slowly are alive. Together. The water is alive. There's so much movement and light and vibrance. And I think that's really kind of the biggest contrast. The city is gray and dull and boring and not unmoving. And the forest is vibrant and colorful and full of life and it's like clearly spent it is a very sharp contrast between these two areas and just the way things go together like everyone in the city seems so separate there's no connection because the lines can make sure there's a key distinction between everyone between each other but thinking of like how the wolves want together and and mm -hmm. the, the great images of them kind of um of the wolf walkers and everything kind of swirls in one big group that really is like a community it's like there's just one giant wolf rather than the 80 wolves together when everyone yeah. in the town looks like they have nothing to do with each other, because well, everyone in the town, rigid. everyone in the town is an asshole. Let's be real. Like everyone <laughs> in the town, is the, except for the great sheep farmer slash the sheep lover. The sheep farmer's from outside the, the town. He yeah. doesn't live in the town. <laughs> He's out there near the forest. Like her dad is a nice person, but everyone else is a is like a jerk or doesn't care about her. Like the kids are all jerks. Most of the adults like just the dad's not even a nice person. I mean, he has to, he's honestly is probably the character that goes through the most growth. <laughs> I think that dad is nice. I think that dad is a nice person. I think he is one of those that are like stuck in the society that you're taught to follow versus learning to you know think for yourself and think more empathetic because he's like, I have this role and I have this job, which is kind of where a lot falls within colonization. People are like they're in charge and they're gonna, you know, do what they say rather than questioning the authority. See, the dad is also the aware character to me. I don't think he's a jerk. I think he's just aware of the actual danger of doing everything you want little kids have this joy of they just want to do whatever they want to do they don't really um they're not really aware of necessarily the potential consequences and the bad stuff that could happen to them if they just do whatever they want the dad is like very well aware of what could happen if he disobeys stuff and does stuff that these people don't want he could end up in chains he could end up arrested his girl could end up arrested you know there's a lot of bad stuff that could happen Cromwell rules because he imposes violence and threats against everybody's life. That's why they follow the rules. So he's aware and of the under, threat. He does this all under um, an idea of a religious purpose, which is also a complex um, thing to kind of force into a kid's movie to make kids understand because he, you know, dies, you know, giving his prayer. He, th he In his mind, he thinks he's doing everything under the, the request of God. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's he's religious and and rigid, in a way that the Irish people, uh, represented by the Wolfwalkers, are spiritual and full of life, and clearly have like um, a devotion to nature. Like there is 
there is spirituality in the wolves and like the idea of the wolf walkers that even the idea of this togetherness of you know human and animal is kind of um has some religious connotations but it's not rigid and like unwieldy like it is it is you know it has this fluidity of just like life and loving and enjoying life rather than just being like my purpose is religious to destroy everything like that the destructive power of religion versus kind of the you know the cooperative power yeah um before we completely move away from the visual star i, I want to bring no, up no. one thing and i want you to know if i'm completely bullshitting this if i'm making this up in my mind um but and i, I try to pay this this is what struck me the second time watching so i really try to pay attention to this the third time as well but i think as the characters you know become wolves and become more ingrained in nature so as um the the, the daughter um robin and her father the you know the english hunters um as they get bitten by wolves and they become wolf walkers themselves which you know means they when they fall asleep they turn the wolves mm -hmm. or they, they don't turn the wolves but like a wolf spirit comes out of them which i think the visuals of that is also pretty um stunning um because the, the the body is the human body is still there sleeping so it doesn't cease to exist um or transform um but as they become more natural even in their human form i think the the lines start on their characters start to blur a little more um from those thick rigid lines that exist within um you know within the city it seems mm -hmm. like they're still they're starting to blend in with the trees a little more there's just like it's a little less clear and a little blurrier in their in their lining and i think the wolf walkers the, the daughter and mom always have that kind of line style uh -huh. i i'm trying to come up with is that always there or is it just how it's kind of drawn to fit in with the nature because they're they, when they're going through this they just happen to be in that natural environment a little more or is that purposeful to exhibiting them kind of um their change and their evolution into becoming more natural creatures um so See, yeah, I, we watch the movie pay attention to this. so <laughs> i think I, I think i understand what you're saying and i would agree yeah. with you i would i would um define it in a slightly different manner yeah i, I think it is less that the lines are rigid versus more fluid I think it is the way that people move in the forest versus when they move I in the city. I think literally the lines are blacker and thicker. And I think that the reason that it happens <laughs> is the way that the characters yeah. move. Everyone in the city is rigid. It's straight lines. It's ordered movement. Yeah. Um, it's very regimented. The forest, they're more free. Meg rolls around all the time. She's like jumping and swinging. And I think, yes, you're right that the character lines do start to blur, but that's because it's a necessity of the movement of the characters as they feel more free inside the forest. Okay. Because even when they exist early in the movies, before there was, I still feel like the lines are really rich. And when they put on yeah. their clothes and their helmets and everything that is unnatural, you can see the richness. Because even of like the hat she wears, you can just see how diagonal it is. Um, oh, yeah. The bonnet. Part yeah. Of it, yeah. It's just very straight edged, and, and and there's some scenes like when they cut with the axe. I feel like they really pinpoint how like sharp headed and and um, you know unnatural that axe looks in its way too. Yeah, I think and it's I also just the contrast way. between the surroundings. I think everything looks harsher and darker and more filled in and blockish mm -hmm. when you're stuck in an environment that's also like that. Um, let's see. I want to talk about some of the voice performances in this film. Um, Sean Bean plays her dad. I think Sean Bean is really good as a voice actor in this film. I think he has this really classic, um, you know, middle of England, Scotland, Ireland, Ireland, like kind of gruff but loving father character down. You know, we've seen him play this in other movies. He's just, he's also just got a great voice. It's very recognizable, but it's also very like, nuance like you can wait it is to you i don't really know anything about sean bean i am not a game of thrones watcher no i just think this is like such a sean bean character and i think it just really i think he really works as the dad in this film i really like his performance i think he just i think vocally he just does, can do he has a lot of um nuance he can do in his voice like there's a lot but he sounds the same like he doesn't have to change his voice to sound to express different feelings but he can modulate it in a way that i think works really effectively yeah, and I think um, especially he, his dialogue mostly consists of him just kind of like shouting and worry and shouting in fear. Mm -hmm. And to do that and not like be obnoxious in a way or to have, you know, still be able to exhibit the heart. Like you, 
can like hear the pain and every time he kind of shouts for robin's name because he's yeah. he, you know he's attacking the wolves in a lot a lot of the scenes in defense of his daughter robin and he's shouting like he's just so confused and lost you hear that in his kind of, of shouting um that i think adds a lot to the performance that maybe another actor you know would exhibit they would just make a little more one-sided just like get away wolves rather than you know adding some kind of empathy to it in those lines I think his voice performance is also important to allowing the character to turn, change size at the end of the film. I, I think that because of the nuance and the clear delineation between hatred of the wolves versus trying to protect his daughter through both keeping his job and then protecting her from the wolves is really important. Um, I, I think that's why when he is bitten and becomes a werewolf and changes size, it doesn't feel unnatural. It doesn't feel wrong. It doesn't feel like uh, like a fake um, you know twist to make the movie feel. You know, like you know, it doesn't feel like a lazy twist at the end of the film. It just really kind of works um, narratively. Yeah, um, I, I do want to shout out voice actors. I think the two girls. It's always smart to cast kids as your kids. That's what Charlie Brown always knew. Uh, but I think especially Eva Whitaker, who plays Mae, the Wolf Walker girl, she's great. Uh, has such a playfulness to it, and, and I think the most emotional scenes of the movie, as uh, she, you know, she, her mom disappears from her, she gets captured by um, the Lord Protector. Uh, and she's trying to still keep her kind of upbeat energy and playfulness and hopefulness. But then, you know, moments of her, you know, she's probably like a seven-year-old um, of, of fear and loneliness creeping in. Um, and especially like any movie where someone doesn't come when you expect them to come is going to like tear me apart. And for some reason, that's like my biggest fear. So I fox yeah. the hound watching like her, his mom leave or the grand old lady leave is like one of the sad scenes, but her like waiting for Robin to come back. I um, mean, and the way the animator too, not just the voice acting, but seeming, you know, still playful and playing around the, the log so she has to kind of come to terms for really just a second before the bird comes of uh, maybe she might not come. It's just, you know, heartbreaking. And I think the performance captures um, that, that mixture of childlike play um, with also just that childlike anxiety as well. That is remarkable. Absolutely. And then her mom, of course, is played by a returning favorite, um, Maria Doyle Kennedy, Rich. who is oh, also a great singer. Zach's favorite <laughs> singer from, of course, uh, why am I blanking on the title of this movie? Um, Zach, the movie we covered with Maria Doyle Kennedy is called... The Commitment! The Commitment! Yay! I already yeah. said it. <laughs> oh, I missed it. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. she's really good. Uh, Simon McBurney as Oliver Cromwell is good. Yeah, I actually did not know his name. He, to me, he's like a real that guy. And he is. He's one of those people that like you look at his picture on Wikipedia and you don't recognize him, and then yeah. you read his, his, um, his list of credits, and you're like, I've seen 20 movies with this guy. Yeah, he's that guy from allied that guy from rogue nation yeah he's just in he's movies in so i many. care about allied yeah he's so many movies just one of those like really he's in cool. harry potter oh he's creature he's the in voice harry of potter. creature yeah who do you find him he's in tinker You're taylor i didn't know that he's in tinker taylor i think he's he's he i think he's uh stephen hawking's dad in the theory of everything yeah he's yeah. in a lot of stuff it's like yeah. one of those British actors that appears in anything British. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at if you it's look Scottish. at British, there's a like, lot of you know the last King of Scotland and the Duchess and Robin Hood and Tinker Taylor and Jane Eyre and that's a lot of uh, you know UK based stuff. Um, Zach, do you have any final thoughts? Oh no, four final thoughts. Score and songs. Let's talk about them. I yeah. love the score. The score rules. It's beautiful, and it changes too. Because during the, the first half of the movie, it's a very like kind of playful Irish song, and the whole second half is it gets like extremely dramatic. I just want to mention how like somber and it's, oh yeah, dense the tone of this movie is. Everything is said with like such seriousness. It's like Mabe, how can you do it? And it's almost like melodramatic, but it, like fully works. And I, no, I find it's really unique for an animated movie. Um, but I think the music changes to go with that. It's it's the kind of like sad violin that I'm just like a real sucker for. Um, that's also just beautiful. And it melds into the songs they include, you know, so naturally into White the Wolves. And it's like one other song that I think they mix in. Absolutely. That, that you don't really notice the transition of how fluid it is. But yeah, Running with the Wolves, the Aurora song works so well in this movie. It's the best scene. It for especially for a song that is not written for this movie. It's a pretty <laughs> typical animation scene, too, that I think they're able to elevate. 
this is like same scene as like them flying and how to, how to train your dragon. It's those kind of like adventure you see the world and them like get like gain well, the like, joy out of their like powers in a way. Or like it's literally any it's it's every superhero movie has the scene. Mm-hmm. Every super origin story has a scene where it's the first time that Spider Man uses his powers or Superman uses his powers. But it is really kind of a really, really good version of that to the point where it is super engaging and really fun to watch them. And there is just so much joy in both the song and the animation. It's like like there is clearly just like an expression of how joyful it is just be able to run with the wolves. Like this freedom, this just like you don't have to deal with all this other stuff in life. It's just you're just running and it's wonderful. And uh, it's just the great magical and whimsical. It's anyways, beautiful. It not yeah. like they have moments where like the wolves literally swirl into a circle, and it fades into another scene, and the, and you can like see the close ups of like the rainfall as they. It's, it's, yeah. I it's do have to say, I, I love with the animation of the wolves. I love how the wolves almost become one, like the pack. Yeah. Like there are individuals in the pack, and sometimes they will spread out and be individuals, and sometimes it's just a pack, and it's almost yeah. like and they run. Mm-hmm. It's just like a constant wave of. It's kind, it's just wonderful. It's like really. Um, because it really underlies how the characters work. They are a pack of wolves. They are not individual characters outside of the mom and Meb. They're individuals. The rest of them are just the wolves, and they run as a pack together. And it's just kind of this yeah. really beautiful um, community of wolves together. It's a literal and metaphorical connectiveness. Absolutely. Um, yeah, score and songs are great. Um, do you have any final thoughts, Zach? Um, I, I, I do want to just say how... I think the emotional payoffs of the film is also very sensitive. So as I said, it has a very you know intense somber tone. The whole last half is just kind of not torturing, but it is there's an emotional pounding um, to it. There's the stakes are really high. You know, it's a lot about it is about um, losing their parents in multiple ways or losing a child. Like um, uh, Sean Bean's character, the dad is is really worried about uh, losing his daughter because they lost you know their wife um, yeah. you know, before the movie takes place. So you there's a lot of, of uh, payoff with that relationship um, and how he's able to, you know, embrace the daughter for who she is and let 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 a little bit of leash um, of his protectiveness while still being able to be part of a life and love. And there's also, you know, the contrast with um, the Wolf Walkers um, daughter mother relationship of probably like ha- of how close they were to where that relationship also started to get uh, a little lost because you know of actual like wolf napping and you know the fear of her mom gonna die and all that childhood fear of what is your life gonna be like or what can you even do without your parents um not to like come off as heartless but when you have like adult loss is kind of like it's it's t- it's terrible it's sad but also like you are an adult and you can go over it but when you have a kid uh, with the kind of idea of losing a parent, it is really like so confusing because you uh, you still need that guidance and you don't know what to do without it. And I think that movie just hits that, like how um, you know powerful it really is for that experience that she thinks she's going to lose her mother. Um, I, I I think the emotional payoff really works, um, and they tie those relationships together at the end where the father gets a joint end with Robin, um, and they kind of like howl together. Um, and to bring her back to life, and I think one of the greatest um, visual shots um, is when she comes back to life and, they, and she hugs uh, Mabe, the mom hugs Mabe, um, and they're like spirits come out, but the spirits come out in the reverse of what they are. So, you know, the mom who is in mom, um, wolf form, like comes out as the mom spirit, and then the you know wolf comes out in the dog spirit. So you see both like pairs of their, their selves. Um, it is really remarkable. Uh, it's it's just a great thing and, and pretty uh, heartfelt. And I may tear up when I just see that image. Uh, this is very much one of those movies. Um, I think one of the best movies of like every scene can be, or every shot can be a poster in my wall. Yeah. Um, it's just every shot is beautiful. And honestly, one of my favorite looking movies of all time for being a new movie. So. Yeah. Um, for my final thoughts, I wanted to talk about 2020 in animation. Um, you've probably seen more animated movies than me. Um, yeah, you haven't seen Marona's Fantastic Tale, my friend. Another really impressionistic and kind of surrealistic uh, animated film that you should watch because it uses this animation with purpose. Yeah, I'm going to watch uh, probably a couple more of them before I finish up with my 2020s. Um, so I have seen so far the two Pixar movies and then Wolf Hawkers. Um, I know that we are probably heading towards an Oscars where Soul wins the Oscar. Um, I think Wolf Walkers is a legitimate 
step ahead of it. Um, I think this is a sort of disappointing year for Pixar. I find both Soul and Onward kind of underwhelming. Um, and Wolf Walkers is just, it's just a joy, an absolute joy to watch. Um, so, yeah. What I'm okay with Soul running. I like Soul quite a bit. I like Wolf Walkers a lot more. I think, I don't think we, because Pixar has a house style at this point. It, it's not anything too similar. They're, it's more impressive rather than the animation being like emotionally compelling. Um, which is what Wolf Walkers is. The animation is, is functional and, uh, or like purposeful, and it's emotionally compelling. And we need to we need to reward movies <laughs> more, like not just animation as a format for telling you know kids stories, but as a format for being creative and expressionistic and actually using the art form in unique yes. ways. Yeah, Wolf Walkers. Which is I think that and Morona's Fantastic Tale, which has no chance of getting an Oscar nomination, both do that. Mm. Yeah, Wolf Walkers is, <clears throat> is really one of these examples of it takes animation, it makes a it, and it does a movie that you could not do in live action. You could not do this movie in live action. There's no way to do this movie could. successfully. It's just not as good. It would not be good. I don't think it'd be very good at all. Um, and, and it just succeeds so well. So, um, yeah, Wolf Walkers, best animated movie of 2020. I think I think we would agree. Uh, one of the best movies, period. Um, we may have a top ten list coming up, and Wolf Walkers may be on one or both of ours. We'll see. It's going to be on five of our lists. We're going five to of our lists. Lot. Zach is doing five different top tens yeah. of the year. And Wolf Walker is on every single one. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that being said, yeah, Wolf Walkers, Apple TV Plus. Watch it, please. It's a great movie. I very much doubt that anyone who watches Wolf Walkers will finish that experience and find it underwhelming which yeah, is and if you do you can keep your opinions to yourself and shut the fuck up but also be honest i feel like there's a lot of <laughs> movies from 2020 you can go right now and watch in a streaming service yeah. that will that i can understand why you'd be anywhere from didn't like it to loved it you know there's a lot of movies that you know from 2020 that are you know your interpretation and your understanding of the film really can play a, a part in how much you enjoy it well, mm -hmm. just is one that I feel like anyone can sit down and watch this movie and just genuinely enjoy it as just a wonderful folktale story of wolves becoming people. And I think that's just kind of uh, special in a year like 2020. Yeah. Um, we're all done. We're done with Wolf Walkers. Oh, shit. I need the lyrics. Let's all right. I'm, I'm, a vamp. I'm vamping. I'm vamping. I'm uh, vamping. I'm just going to sing running with the wolves because that song's great. We don't need to do Lucas and Zach podcast. Give me one second, Zach. Oh, I gotta yeah. finish this. Next week we're coming back, oh. and we're coming back for our most, um, our biggest episode yet. We're doing small acts. We're doing all of them. Small acts is not one movie. It is five individual movies. It's definitely not a TV show. Definitely not a TV show. We're going to talk about them each in some order, and then probably the thing as a, as a whole. Um, because I don't know if Zach agrees with me. I think small acts is the cinematic achievement of 2020. The singular cinematic cinematic achievement of 2020. I mean, we just and talked about Wolfwalkers. I no, I love Wolfwalkers, and Wolfwalkers is great. I just think what Steve McQueen did with yes, five I movies agree. is insanely impressive. Yes, um, and so is um, Rachel McAdams seeing the um, the the accomplishment of 2020. Let us not compare singing in a comedy to stories of... I, I'm going to make you do a two-thing rank, and you've got to rank all small acts versus Yaya yeah, Ding Dong. Go. Yaya Ding Dong is better <laughs> than three of the small acts movies. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, all right. We're coming back to that next week. We will see you then. Um, uh, it's going to be a long episode next week. Get ready. Watch some small acts. Come join us. Uh, these are films that deserve to be examined and dissected. With that being said, see you then. Bye-bye. Yeah. And I got to tell you something. I'm running with the wolves tonight. Lucas and Zach pa ha, 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 cast. I'm running with the wolves tonight. Lucas and Zach pa ha, 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 cast. I'm running with the...